special worship service for this Sunday, August 9th, 2020. We are so glad you could join us this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful to worship you, to come into your presence, to lift our voices in praise of your glorious riches and mercy, to remember all that you have done for us. Lord, as we worship you in this time together today, we ask that your spirit would move among us. Cause us, Lord, to focus on you, to hear you, to worship you. We commit this service to you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our first song is What Have We to Offer? You'll find that in the worship order where the words and music are printed. Let us sing together. We read in the first letter from the Apostle John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth of God is not in us, but if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us from all unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news of the Gospel. In, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us now 
Go to God with the prayers of the people and the prayer of thanksgiving for all that God has given us as individuals, families, and as a church. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful to be able to gather to worship you, even in this unconventional way, Lord. We are grateful to be able to connect and to give you praise and thanks. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would hear our concerns. Lord, there are many who in this pandemic have lost work. Help them to find jobs. Help those families that are now struggling financially to make ends meet. Lord, as we get near the school year, we ask that you would protect our children from this virus. Help them to understand how to do their work, to do their schooling in a different way. We pray for our school administrators, teachers, and staff. Watch over them, Lord. Protect them. Give them the strength and resources and the creativity with which they need to do their work. And be with those, Lord, who are making decisions as a result of this pandemic. Give them wisdom, guide their steps. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, not only from this pandemic, but from other concerns. We pray for their healing. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those who mourn, that you would continue to bring them comfort. And Lord, we pray that you would pour your Spirit out among us. Lord, we have been reluctant to turn to you in this time of pandemic. We have looked everywhere else for help but you. So forgive us, Lord, for looking to politicians and social media and everything else but you. Turn our hearts toward you, move your spirit among us, that we would seek you first, especially now. Guide our church, Lord, as we seek to glorify you and share your good news and bless our brothers and sisters in Christ and other church families, Lord, as they seek to share the good news of your salvation, as they seek to be your light in the world. Lord, we thank you for the generosity that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give to your work. We ask that you would continue to bless those offerings that have been given to your work that they would glorify you and help to share your good news. All of these things we pray in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come now to that part of our service where we are going to turn to the scriptures, I invite you to again join me in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we ask now that as we turn to your scriptures, that you would turn our hearts toward you, pour your spirit out among us, give us understanding, Lord, help us to be changed by your word. For we ask this. Christ's holy name. Amen. 
Our passage today is Matthew chapter 5. We are continuing in our study of Matthew's Gospel. We will be doing this for quite a while. Matthew is not the longest Gospel, but it is long. And we want to consider what Jesus taught in this Gospel. So here we are at Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount on Anger. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. One of the weirdest things about me, and now after this you get to say, hey, you want to hear a weird thing about Pastor John? I love natural disasters. Now, I hate that they can be deadly. I do not like when people get caught up in them and lose their lives, or when their livelihoods or their way of life is damaged. But I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated when nature, when creation, just kind of flexes its muscle. It's exciting to watch. I have witnessed many natural disasters in my 52 years, but the one that really has yet to touch my life, thank God, has been that of a volcano. Now, I did get to visit Old, Old Faithful in Yellowstone in 1993. Old Faithful is a large vent of steaming hot water. It is the result of an active volcano under. And so I guess you could say it's been touched, touched my life, but not really, not in the way that we understand volcanoes. But in my view, volcanoes tend to come in three varieties. The inactive, and we're not dealing with them today. The small active volcanoes, and then the large active volcanoes. Now when I say small and large, I am speaking to the scope of damage, the level of activity and impact. The volcano in Hawaii, for example, is an active volcano, but it's kind of a small deal because it spews lava at such a slow and predictable rate that the residents and the tourists can actually plan around it. They can walk up to it, take pictures, do selfies, at the volcano, while the lava is just creeping along. Kind of exciting. Still inconvenient though, you still have to plan around. And then you have large active volcanoes like Mount St. Helens, which is still an active volcano. But in 1980, those of us who were alive then remember how it erupted and the entire side of the mountain blew off. It changed the landscape and the region permanently. Its eruption caused massive disruption. Now in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, Jesus is teaching on anger. And he explains how unchecked anger complicates everything. Anger is like a volcano, large or small. It has an impact, and not only on the life of the angry person. Now, Jesus is not speaking about righteous anger. Righteous anger is the anger we feel when there is an injustice that needs to be made right. Righteous anger stems from that innate sense of right and wrong 
that is a reflection of God's image in each of us. And since God hates injustice, and God stands in the gap for the disenfranchised, when we witness that, we have a tendency to want to do something about it. It gets us riled up. That's a good thing. That's righteous anger. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. The anger that Jesus is speaking of is the anger that comes out of sinfulness. It creates sinfulness. It has the potential to destroy the lives of everyone who are, who's caught in the path of the angry person when they dwell. It is an anger that is basically about a sinful loss of self-control. Jesus is speaking to people who are under the rule of the Roman Empire, and they were tired of centuries of foreign rule. They were frustrated by confusing and hypocritical leadership by their religious officials. And so this led to a kind of latent anger that was just under the surface of everything that was going on. And so riots, demonstrations, and violence were regular occurrences. Sound familiar? Jesus uses a number of teaching methods in his ministry, and one of his favorites shows up here in our passage, where he takes a familiar saying and he turns it on his head. So it always starts with, you have heard, and then he says, but I say to you. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter. Anger is not only about the action. It starts in the heart. And if we don't get to the heart of the matter with anger, when it blows, it will complicate and destroy. All of us hearing these words of Jesus in Matthew 5 this morning ought to be concerned. Jesus is point blank saying, words kill. In a world full of keyboard warriors hiding behind our screens, we are quite careless with our words. Six years ago, Justine Sacco, a now former PR executive who should have known better, tweeted this as she was getting on an airplane, going to Africa, I hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. She got fired for that remark, and rightly so. A bit closer to home, I have noticed alarming remarks on one of the Facebook pages that lists EMS calls, especially when those calls are about opioid overdose. I have read things from people in our region here saying things like, waste of resources, it's their own fault, they should let them die. It's easy to say things like that when you're a stranger to the patient, when you think the screen between protects you from them. But these patients, they are someone's child, someone's parent, someone's spouse. They are human and they matter. And this is precisely the point Jesus is getting at. Anger is a matter of the heart. So words can hurt and kill. Right now, there are a number of things that are making us, as a society, collectively angry. Most of them are connected to the pandemic. And so a lot of it's out of our control, and so we struggle to have that, that control, and so we get angry that it's not in our control. So a lot of things have changed. Going shopping for groceries was something I used to really enjoy. I hate it now. You have to be careful what you touch, how you go in the store, who you're close to, how you check out, what you touch. 
everything's harder. There are people who have lost jobs. Families that used to rely on two incomes now have one, and they're desperate to make ends meet, and they're angry about it. There are some people who have moved from an office to telework, and even though they're safer, now their job is harder. All of it's harder than it used to be, and it's made us tired and anxious. And on top of that, we have politicized this virus in such a way that the smallest offense garners a large, angry response. And when you add to that that there are issues that absolutely should make us angry, like racial injustice, and there are other things besides that, it becomes so easy to say or type a careless word. Those careless words can lead to careless, angry actions. Then we get in real trouble. I remember when road rage was a fairly new phenomenon. About 20 years ago, when I lived outside of Philadelphia, there was a horrible incident on a road that Philadelphians know of as the Blue Route. A guy got cut off by another guy, and he chased the guy for like five or six miles, and then pulled up next to him and shot him. He was angry, and his anger led to some horrible actions. That is the very definition of volcanic, out of control anger. But what Jesus gets at in this passage is that it's not only the actions of anger that matter, but where they come from. Anger comes from the heart. It comes from inside of us. In the Avengers movies and comics, there is one hero who is very dangerous, the Hulk. The Hulk is actually a scientist, Bruce Banner, whose experiments have left him infected with a radiation that when he gets angry, can make him lose control and turn into a giant green rage monster. Of course, that's helpful when you're fighting the bad guys. But in the first Avengers movie, Tony Stark, Iron Man, asked Dr. Banner what his secret is to keeping it contained. And eventually Banner answers, my secret, I'm always angry. We are always angry, it destroys us from the inside out. It wrecks the relationships with the people closest to us. When we are always angry, we lack the very peace that ought to mark our lives as followers of Christ. And on top of that, according to this passage, Jesus warns us that anger can block us from a meaningful and deep relationship with God. So what are we to do with our anger? What should the person who follows Christ do so that anger doesn't lead to volcanic eruption and disaster? In a word, we are to reconcile. Here again, verses 22 through 24. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable for judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now it kind of seems like Jesus is intimating here that careless, angry words themselves risk the very fire of hell. What Jesus is doing is showing us that what we say is a reflection of who we really are. Out of control anger is an issue that begins in the heart. Jesus encourages two actions, two ways of reconciling. First, in our hearts, and that's reflected in what we say, and then, when possible, with other people. He wants us to take anger seriously. Now, Jesus warns us here for the common threat. 
that if they're careless with their words in anger, they might end up before the council. The council was led by the high priest. It was populated mostly by aristocrats, you know, wealthy and politically connected people. Why the world has not changed all that much. And so if someone was accused of a sin, they were brought before the council who acted as both judge and jury. When Jesus is arrested later in the Gospels, he is brought before the council. Now, up to this point in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has called out the Pharisees and others for half-hearted, inauthentic, inauthentic actions and hypocritical interpretations of the law. But he's shifting gears here. He's warning everybody, every single person who hears him. He's basically saying this, saying it makes you just as guilty as doing it. Don't just focus on action like the Pharisees love to do. Focus on your heart. Now Jesus encourages reconciliation wherever possible. Note here that he basically tells his hearers that if they hold an angry grudge, it's going to affect their ability to worship. Anger can put a wedge between us and God. So even if someone is bringing an offering, and they think that their neighbor is upset with them for something, they need to go and work that out before bringing the offering. And notice, Jesus says, settle with your adversary on the way to court. What he's saying there is, the earlier you fix anger, the better. Because if you let it fester, it grows and grows, and it gets harder. Now, what Jesus is not implying is that reconciliation is a one-way street. It's possible to misread this passage and think that it's on the person who think that someone else might be mad at them to go to that person. And if you're the person who's angry, what you can't read in this passage is, I'll just wait for them to come to me. It's not what Jesus is saying. He is saying, if you've got a grudge, if you're angry, angry, angry at somebody, someone's angry at you, before you set foot in the house of God, work it out. Fix it as much as you are able. Because anger is a corrosive motion. The longer anger stays inside of us, the more damage it does to us. It's like the rust on a car. If we leave it alone, it spreads. We don't want anger to spread through our lives and blind us from our relationship with God and others. Now, let me reiterate. This is not about righteous anger. We are dealing with anger that leads to sin. It hurts ourselves and others. Because yes, anger hurts us. There are two ways we apply this passage to our lives, personally and relationally. And they're absolutely intertwined, so if you are struggling with anger, it doesn't matter which one you choose to focus on first, the relational one or the personal one, they kind of go together. When it comes to personal anger, one of the most important questions we can ask is this, what makes me angry? Anyone struggling with anger at all needs to deal with this question, and not just one time. It is an ongoing discussion in our heads. Because once we notice we're angry, we need to ask ourselves, why am I so angry right now? What is it about this that's got me so fired up? Is it really about this? Or is there something else going on in my life, and this is a good way to let that anger out? got to explore that if you are struggling with anger. Because if we have chronic unresolved anger, we've got to figure out why we're so wound up. And when we understand that, that enables us, and it's not just a quick, short process, but we can get on the other side of it eventually and learn to respond in a more godly way. Otherwise, we leave that unchecked. 
that anger is going to corrode our hearts. And it's also a matter of prayer. We're dealing with anger personally. We need to pray about it. We need to ask God to help us understand our anger. We need to ask God to help us deal with it so that it does not control us. In Genesis 4, Cain and Abel bring offerings to God, and God rejects Cain's. And that's because Cain just kind of realized, uh-oh, worship starts in five minutes, better grab something and get it together and brought it to God. Abel, on the other hand, put a lot more thought into it. He said, what's the best thing I can give God? What is the most treasured thing I have? Well, let me give that to God. And so, of course, God says, good job, Abel. Cain, try again. Cain gets mad, not at God, but at his brother. Listen to this in Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. If anger is something we struggle with, it is something we must take to the Lord and ask Him to help us to master it so that it does not master us. And the reason we need to do that is because it affects our relationships. And that gets us to the second point, because they are intertwined. Here's the simplest way to understand why we need to reconcile. We should never respond in anger. That's easy to say. Never respond in anger. Here's what that looks like in real life. When a family member says or does something that infuriates us, when a friend or a co-worker says something that just gets us riled up, take a breath. Hit the pause button. Maybe give ourselves a time out. If we, still, if we still feel like the next thing we're going to do or say is rooted in anger, then we need to walk away until we can more clearly control what comes next. It works the same way on social media. It's so easy for us to think that the screen between us and others is some kind of buffer of protection. That we don't have to be responsible for what we type. Far from it. Rather, what we ought to do is think about it this way. What would I say if I was in the same room as the person I'm responding to? Or better yet, does my response honor Christ? Will people see Jesus in how I respond to this? And you know what? It's okay not to respond to things. Nothing will happen to you. It's okay. Where there is already an angry rift or a divide, we need to reconcile. And the sooner the better. And remember, reconciliation is a win for everyone. Everybody should walk away from a moment of reconciliation confident about the relationship. Anger affects our relationships with others and with God, and if we leave it unchecked, it can blow up like a volcano and creates all kinds of damage. As followers of Christ, that is not who we are. We need to strive for better. We must keep our emotions in check and our anger under control. And we need to reconcile when it's called for. We need to be people of peace. That doesn't make us weak, by the way. It is so easy and predictable to be angry. It is so much harder to be a person of peaceful self-control. Remember what Jesus said at the beginning of this sermon. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. We live in an angry time. Everyone is so angry. And it seems like it takes so little to make someone so mad. 
So if we want to be light in the world, if we want to help bring peace to an unsettling time, then we do well to keep our anger in check, to never respond in anger. And that will keep our anger from complicating everything and will lead us to better glorifying Christ in all things. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we live in a time where it is so easy for us to give in to anger. It seems like everyone is angry, even your children. That is not who you've called us to be. So where we struggle with anger, Lord, help us to have self-control. Help our words to give life and not to bring death. Help our actions to be rooted in a spirit of love and peace and light, to be rooted in you and not rooted in anger. Help us, Lord, to shine forth your light and love in this dark and angry world that people would find you and seek you. For we ask this in Christ's name. Our final song for the morning is Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. Let us sing together.